Hello, this is Dr. Moyer. Welcome to Chapter 3 of your Healthy Sexuality textbook, where we are going to be talking about male anatomy. Recall that I have posted on D2L under the content section, there's a link called Videos, and you will find two videos that go over male internal and external sex organs, so I won't be going over those in great detail in the PowerPoint. Going back to the penis, though, I did want to talk about um, both size and erection um, because these are two things that aren't found on the diagram, but I, I did want to mention some things about this. Generally, men are very concerned about the size of their penis. Um, there's a lot of myths about penis size and what's normal, what's not normal. Generally, the average size when not erect is three to four inches, and when the penis is erect, it's the average size is five inches, but can get up to seven inches. So this idea that men have, you know, foot long or 16 inch, or 16 inches in length, um, penis size is, it's not typical. It's it's not normal, and men shouldn't try to strive for that. Um, and myth, there are myths that prevail regarding having more or less intercourse and other ways to increase penis size, but there's absolutely no research to support those. So um, many times you'll see products advertised that claim to help men grow their penis, but really you, you just can't do that. Nature determines the size of the penis. Erection, what I wanted to talk about is how when a male becomes excited, um, blood does rush to the penis and it does become erect, feels very hard, um, there are different names for it that people have used, um, but generally referring to an erect penis, you, what I want you to remember about it is that there isn't a bone inside of it, even though it feels hard when it is erect as though there is a bone. Um, it is blood flow and it is cartilage, it's not bone. However, with that being said, uh, men can actually injure themselves if they're not careful um, if the penis is bent during intercourse or sex play, while it's erect, it can become injured. And so they should seek medical attention when this does occur. Okay, uh, moving on to testosterone. It is the main male hormone. Um, secretion begins during fetal development and it does stimulate the formation of the male sex organs. Um, then it lowers at birth, but raises again during puberty, and that's when the development of secondary sexual characteristics like hair growth, voice change, um, heavier muscle and bone mass, etc., um, do develop. And you can see on this diagram that, um, again, testosterone is released in the fetus and helps the fetus to develop sex organs. And then testosterone goes down, goes up again during adolescence, and that's when the secondary sex characteristics occur during puberty. And then the, the peak time for testosterone production is during a male's 20s and 30s. But they do produce testosterone well up into their 70s, 80s, 90s. It's just that the amount of testosterone goes down over time. Male circumcision is also something I wanted to talk about with the class. Um, it is relatively common. About 65% of American men are circumcised, and generally what we're referring to or what's happening is the foreskin here is actually removed, typically when the male is an infant, um, so that there isn't any foreskin that covers the head of the penis. Um, and this is thought to be, well, generally this is done, or typically it used to be done for religious reasons, but now a lot of people choose to do it because they believe it does reduce the risk of, of health concerns or cleanliness. Um, there's a lot of myths that circumcision will help men avoid or reduce the risk of them developing cancers or other or catching as sexually transmitted infections but there's absolutely no research to support that um, one thing it does do as far as cleanliness 
If men are not circumcised, they should be careful about pulling back the foreskin and, and cleaning the head. Um, there can be this white discharge that gathers under here, referred to as smegma. Um, there's nothing harmful about it, not, nothing hurtful, um, but it should be removed, cleaned so that they can avoid any type of health problem. <clears throat> I want to end with talking about some specific needs for men when it comes to medical care. We have a great deal of focus on women's health care needs, particularly when it comes to um, the reproductive organs and pap smears and pregnancy, etc. But men's sexual and reproductive health needs are often ignored. Um, they're not as obvious as women's or as like as in your face. And so lots of men go through their whole life without getting any medical attention when it comes to their sexual and reproductive health, but they do actually need it. So researchers say that there are five things that men need. They need information and education. So they need not just women, lots of times females are given a lot more information about menstruation because I mean it is a concern to start all of a sudden finding blood in their underwear not knowing why. Um, I can see why that would be something we make sure females know about. But males need to know about changes too in, in sex organs that are developing. Men also need access to routine screening and treatment for sexually transmitted infections. So women um, have access through not only their physicians or OBGYNs, but also family planning centers will provide routine screening. Um, they'll do pap smears and treatment testing for sexually transmitted infections. They, there's very few places that do that for men. Public health um, agencies or offices will do that, as well as other you know, regular doctor's offices. But it can be somewhat embarrassing um, for males to ask to be tested or treated. And so really, they need, a, they need access to confidential or anonymous treatment, um, just like females have. They need access to counseling and support for various issues that come up um, as far as their reproductive health. They need health insurance coverage. Um, there's been a big argument with Obamacare about covering female birth control options, but there are male birth control options as well. And the, we'll talk about those later this semester. And those also should be covered. Um, and then training for healthcare professionals when it comes to working directly with males. So oftentimes, Healthcare professionals are comfortable and used to dealing with females and know what kinds of questions are always asking about the menstrual cycle. When was the first day of the last menstrual cycle is a very common question. Um, but when it comes to men, those questions are not asked as often um, unless prompted. And so and men typically are, are not comfortable bringing up if they are having any issues. They don't, they don't see their doctors often, so they don't bring them up. Um, so these are the five things that are recommended that men need when it comes to their sexual and reproductive health needs, um, and you should know what those are. Hint, hint, um, you'll be seeing this again. And that concludes um, my talk on Chapter 3. Okay, thank you.